appetizer you might serve that is somewhat healthy and yet at the same time really yummy. Uh, I've got a great one for you. This is a stuffed mushroom. It works for any occasion, holidays, um, even an afternoon snack, which is something I like. Um, so I've got some mushrooms. I used large button mushrooms that I have taken the stems out. To take a stem out of a mushroom, it's pretty easy. You take a spoon and you would just scoop out the stem and it comes right out. I like to bake the stems right in with the mushrooms so that I can get them cooked and I can use them in a soup, in a soup later. Uh, so I actually s put my mushrooms in a glass pan. You don't need to grease it because it's not going to stick and the most simple recipe that I could think of for stuffed mushrooms turns out to be the best. It's always that way, isn't it? I've got large chunks of cheddar cheese. All you need is a chunk of cheddar cheese and you put that in the center of the mushroom. Um, it's kind of a fitting sort of game, but you just put the chunk of cheddar cheese in the mushroom. If you have to cut it one piece in two, you can do that. And I'm going to sprinkle these mushrooms with a little bit of garlic powder and salt. You don't want to use fresh garlic for this. You'll get clumps of it. You want to just sprinkle it very lightly. The garlic flavor is going to come through and you're going to get it right on top of the mushroom, which is where you want it. You don't want it in the bottom of the pan. You just sprinkle that on top and simply pour some brandy uh, into the bottom. Now, if you are not an alcohol lover, you could certainly use water or a chicken broth or even a vegetable broth. And you pour that right in there and you pop it in the oven. What you don't want to do is you want to, don't want to overbake it so the cheese melts all over the pan. So you want to bake it just until the cheese melts and you can pick up the mushroom at that, at that point. How many of you open a package of stuffing mix and then add some water to it? Yeah, we can do better than that today. Uh, in my house, we make our own stuffing. Um, my kids always like it. Everybody likes it, and there's lots of things that can be done with it. So what I have here is I've got some onions and celery that have already been sautéing to save some time. I added one stick of butter because it's it's stuffing, and, and we're making a lot, so. Um, I, just so it doesn't stick. I don't need to brown my onions or my celery because basically they're going to cook in the oven too, but I do want to have them soft so that they have some sort of caramelization on them. So what we want to do is then add some spices and I've, add, uh, I've added some um, sage and some mar marjoram and some rosemary. Um, I even added a little poultry seasoning in there, some salt and pepper. And what I want to do is I want to cook my spices a little bit in my onions and my celery so that I bring out the natural oils and the spices. So I'm just going to give them a minute. Oh my gosh, this smells so good. Once you add those spices, it smells just like um, my house at, a, at, a, at holiday time. All right, so I've added my spices. I just need to give them a minute to incorporate into the onions. Now what I want to do is I want to make sure that I have enough salt in my stuffing because once I add some raw eggs, which is what I'm going to add, I'm not going to want to taste it. So I've got some chicken broth here. I'm going to go ahead and add my chicken broth. Okay, so what I have is almost looks like a chicken soup here. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I want to cool this just a little bit because I don't necessarily want to put some raw eggs into a hot mixture. And I'm going to go ahead and pour that into this very large bowl very carefully. The reason I'm not adding my bread right into the skillet is I don't think it's going to fit. Okay, And I've got all kinds of vegetables. Now if I wanted to add carrots to this, my mother used to add mushrooms. You can certainly add any sort of vegetable you wanted to your stuffing. That looks good enough to eat like soup. <laughs> all right. You could certainly add um, any sort of uh, hot peppers to make it spicier if you'd like, which makes it really good if you are a spice lover. I like to add a little bit of fresh parsley just to give it a little bit of uh, a green color and make it look pretty. And it certainly parsley freshens up the flavor also. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and mix my raw eggs in here because it's cool enough. It's not going to cook those eggs. 
And the number one tool that you'll need to use with stuffing is your hands. So when you're making your stuffing, you're going to need to use your hands just to get all the bread incorporated. Now, I've got a nice, fluffy white Italian bread. It's really hard to tell what sort of uh, proportion you need of bread to liquid until you try the bread because sometimes the bread is drier than others and it'll soak up more liquid. So I have some extra bread here in case I need it and I of course could add some extra moisture. But uh, what we're doing here is I'm just sprinkling my bread in here. I'm leaving this crust on. There's no need to put take the crust off. You could toast it if you'd like and that actually helps absorb a little bit more water but you're going to you possibly could put, put this in a, um, in a piece of meat, like a turkey or even a stuffed flank steak. So you don't necessarily need to um, toast the bread because it's going to cook some more. And you can see now as you mix, as you're mixing here, then the bread is absorbing all of that liquid. Stuffing that's warm will take about 30 to 40 minutes. If it's cold, which often in, in my house, I like to make my stuffing ahead of time and then go ahead and get it ready and then I'll put it in the refrigerator and let it uh, chill until I'm ready to bake it. The bread's still absorbing that moisture. I think this looks real good to me. I guess I could add more bread if I wanted to, but I don't need to. I think it looks great. So what can you do with your stuffing? Well, there's all kinds of fun things you can do with stuffing. I've got a baking dish here. My daughter really likes it when I put stuffing in a muffin tin and it makes little stuffing muffins and that's fun for her. She enjoys that. You can certainly stuff it right into the meat as well, just now as, as, as you are uh, getting it ready. But I'm going to go ahead and bake my stuffing, and I'm going to put it into my pan. Um, and as we put the stuffing in the pan, you need to be aware that when we're putting it in here, we don't want to overfill our pan. Because as I said, the stuffing is going to puff up. So when we're doing this, we want to make sure we leave room for that stuffing to puff up. But um, I'm going to put this in the oven and we'll catch you back later when it's all done. Ever wonder what to do with all those leftovers from your holiday meal? Well, I've got some great ideas for you, and involves a waffle maker. So basically, I've got some leftover mashed potatoes that I had from either Sunday dinner or a holiday meal, and I have some leftover cranberry sauce that I had, so I'm going to make a savory waffle, and you're really going to like this one. So I've got some buttermilk in a bowl, uh, and buttermilk is going to help our waffles become light and fluffy. And I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of eggs to my buttermilk. And I want to beat my eggs first. The reason I want to beat my eggs first before I add my flour is I do not want to overmix this mixture once I get to my flour. If I overmix the mixture, then the leavening agent, which is the baking powder and the baking soda in these waffles, will start to act already. And all the bubbles that I've worked so hard to put in by putting that baking soda and baking powder in will pop. So if I get my liquid ingredients ready and my dry ingredients ready separately, then I'm good. So I've got my liquid ingredients. I want to incorporate my mashed potatoes now. It may be a little tough. Depending on, now these are cold, so I want to show you how this can be done. Sort of it's all out there. Okay. So I'm going to try to incorporate my mashed potatoes right into my batter. And if I do this again ahead of time, um, it's okay to have some potato lumps, but you don't want to have too many potato lumps because at that point you'll have a big lump of potatoes and no batter in there. So we want to smash our potatoes up. I'm not sure if that's a technical cooking term, but that's literally what we're going to do. We're going to smash our leftover mashed potatoes up into the batter and we're going to add some good stuff. We want some color, we want some crunch, we want some flavor. So I'm smelling some garlic in there because I like to make garlic mashed potatoes, but one can never have too much garlic, so we're going to add some more too. So I've got most of my lumps out. I can get most of them out and I can leave a few lumps, but I don't want any big pieces of mashed potato, especially when they're cold. I guess I could heat my potatoes up, but then at that point what you'd do is you'd cook your eggs, so I really wouldn't recommend that. If you had hot mashed potatoes, you'd want them at least at room temperature. 
Okay? And this makes a great breakfast. And the other thing it's going to make, and you, when you see it, you'll realize it's going to make a great appetizer. You can cut it up into squares and make a great appetizer, which sounds a little bizarre since a waffle is supposed to be for breakfast, but not today. We're making leftover waffles. Okay, so I've got some cheddar cheese and some mixed up Monterey Jack and cheddar. And one can never have too much cheese. So I'm sprinkling my cheese in my batter. And I still have my liquid ingredients put together. And I'm going to use some scallions. I could use chives. I could use onions. Um, but I think scallions have a nice sharp flavor. And yet at the same time, they're nice and mild. So they make this waffle a great treat. So basically all we have are mashed potatoes and cheese and buttermilk right now. And it's pretty smooth. There's not too many big lumps, and that's what you want. Now we're going to come to the waffle part. We're going to go ahead and add some butter, melted or softened, and that's going to incorporate nicely in here. Okay. And then I've got my dry ingredients. I want to mix my dry ingredients together so that I can make a nice smooth batter. So I have flour here. All-purpose flour works real well. And I have sugar because my waffle is going to be somewhat sweet. Let's throw my sugar in there. And baking powder, baking soda, a little garlic powder like I said, and some salt. Not too much because I think my potatoes were salty enough to begin with. Again, I want to mix my dry ingredients together so you do not get large pieces uh, or lumps of baking powder and baking soda. And so what we want to do, we want to make sure that we're mixing them up and then we're just going to put them into the, the batter. And at this point, this is when we don't want to over mix it. This is smelling just divine. It looks good too it's a leftover waffle therefore you use your leftovers okay so it's a homogeneous mixture it's not over mixed I can see some lumps I'm not alarmed by that that's okay now I'm going to take my waffle maker which is preheated you can use a Belgian waffle maker or you can take uh, use a, a regular one which is what I'm using most people have a regular one and I'm going to put about a quarter of a cup in each chamber you don't want to overfill this. Mmm, it smells great. I'm going to spread it around somewhat. You want to try to keep it away from the edge. And I'm going to close my waffle maker slowly. And that's going to then toast it up. You've got leftover gravy from your roast, whether it's a turkey or uh, beef or pork and look we're going to put some gravy on top of our leftover waffle. So these are cooking for a couple minutes and while they cook they're going to get crispy and we don't want to peak because we want to get the waffles to the point where they're crispy and they come out easily. A special dish we make at my house for celebrations is a pumpkin praline pie, and tis the season for that, definitely. So you can see that I've made a pie already, and what I've done is I've used a pre-made pie shell. I think most people do that these days. You could certainly make your own, and maybe another time we'll do that for you. But today I made a pre-made pie shell, and I'm going to show you just how to do that. Um, I use, I'm using a glass pan. And I just put the pie shell, as I unrolled it, right into my glass pan. And I'm going to show you how to make that pretty edge. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take two fingers on my left hand, because I'm left, or right handed. I'm going to take one finger on my right hand, and I'm going to pinch. So I'm going to show you how to do this. I'm going to pinch with my left and pinch with my right. So I lift it up with my right hand. I pinch with my left with my right finger here, and I make a little flute. And I keep going all the way around. Two fingers on the left, one on the right, the opposite if you're left-handed. Okay, and I'm just going to go all the way around the pie shell. If you had extras and you needed to fill in some holes, 
you could do that and you could double over this if you had a little bit of extra here you can double over on the pie shell fold it over and pinch it that way so basically I'm just going around the entire pie shell and what we're going to do and then I'm going to show you how to make a filling after we're done with this so it makes that really pretty edge a lot of people like to make fork edges I kind of like this one and really it's very forgiving you can fold things under you can tuck them in you know what I mean so basically you can just pinch and make little flutes so I'm gonna keep doing this for a minute and as soon as I'm done we'll make the good part the filling you can see how I'm doing that I don't want my edge to burn so I want to make sure when I'm baking my pie that I would like to keep some tin foil or aluminum foil right along the edge because this edge is higher than the pie shell so what we're going to do when we bake this pie is halfway into the baking period I'm going to go ahead and put some foil around the edge because a lot of times what happens is you'll get a burnt edge and then the filling is not done okay so we're going to make a filling now and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this aside for just a minute because we're going to fill that in a sec I'm going to make a filling and it's a pumpkin custard um, this particular pie is a pumpkin praline pie. What that means is I'm going to make a topping on it. And that also means that I'm going to have a little extra pie filling. And I'm going to show you what to do with that little extra pie filling to make a goodie if you're not quite ready to eat your pie. My kids always like when I made the extra little tidbit. So let's start with the filling. I'm going to go ahead and use a can of evaporated milk. You do not want to use, you don't want to use the sweetened condensed milk. That's the very sweet stuff. You don't want to use that. That's going to make a mess. This is some melted butter. It was melted, but it's close enough now. As long as it's soft, that works real well. Okay. And the star of the show, the pumpkin. A lot of people think, well, I should be going out to the fields and picking pumpkins, and perhaps maybe it would taste fresher or better. In my opinion, that's not true. I think the canned pumpkin is just as good and a whole lot easier, trust me. If you've tried to make fresh pumpkin pie, it's hard. So I, I mean, I'm pretty much of a cook and I don't do that. Couple of eggs. All right. And of course, some sugar because we want our pie to be sweet. All right, this is looking good already. And for a little color and for a little richness, some molasses. I like molasses a lot. By the way, if you ran out of brown sugar, you know you can make your own sugar by adding just a little bit of molasses to some plain sugar. So this is almost like mimicking brown sugar, but I have a little bit more molasses than you would in a package of brown sugar. And last but not least, we have spices. Ginger, cinnamon, cloves. Um, I always like to double the cinnamon in any recipe I see. I've already doubled the cinnamon for this one. But if you like more cinnamon, feel free to go ahead and do that. So I'm just going to mix this mixture, and I want to make sure my eggs get beaten up, so I'm going to go ahead and use a wire whisk just to beat my eggs. And it doesn't hurt if you overmix this. You can mix it as long as you'd like. And it's going to start to look yummy. And it smells divine. I wish you had a smell camera here. You could smell this. It smells great. A lot of people like to put butter in their pie filling. You certainly don't have to. You could use oil or you could use nothing. I've seen so many recipes for pumpkin pie. Um, I kind of go through a lot of butter at holiday time sometimes. All right, so this is all mixed up. You can see it's all homogeneous. It's all together. And I scrape the sides and that looks delicious. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take my pretty pie shell that I just made and I'm going to pour this into that. But I want to explain a couple things first. See this pie shell, this pumpkin pie I've already made. You don't realize this, but this pumpkin pie literally was frozen raw. I made the pie shell raw. I put the pumpkin into the pie shell raw and I froze it just like that. There's two ways you can do this pie. Uh, the praline mixture is going to be, as you're going to see, some brown sugar, some pecans, and some butter. Basically what we can do is at this point I can mix my filling or my topping and I could put it in the bottom of the pie shell before I put my pumpkin in. It's not my best best choice though. The reason being that the, the, pie, the, the pralines get stuck in the bottom, it's really hard to get the pie out. 
But if you wanted to put your pralines in the bottom, you can certainly do that. I found it better, it's a, a little extra step, but it works much better to freeze the pie shell and the pie filling first and then put the praline on as a topping. That way it doesn't stick to the bottom of the pie shell. But you could do it either way. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my pie shell that I've already made, it's all pretty, and I'm going to pour my pumpkin filling right into my pie shell. Now one thing I don't want to do is overfill my pie shell because as I told you, I'm going to go ahead and add some, another layer of topping on there. So I, I'm going to have a little bit extra. This is the part my kids really like. I want to fill it till it's almost to the bottom of that, almost to the bottom of the fluting. Because what happens when you bake pumpkin pie is actually puffs up because there's air that we've added into it and the eggs and all of the other ingredients turn to steam and it puffs up. So at this point, if I wanted to make the same pie, I would take it, I would put it in the freezer and I'd pull it out and it would look like that. So here's the unfrozen variety and here's the frozen. Now this is the part my kids like. I have a little extra pumpkin filling because I'm not going to fill that quite so much. So I have a couple of greased custard cups and I've got them in a pan of water and I actually add my extra little bit of pumpkin in here into my custard cups and I bake a couple of custards then alongside my pie and my kids get to taste it right before we, you know, you're always waiting to break into that pie, but this way you get to taste your pumpkin before you get to the pie. These don't take long, they take about 15, 20 minutes, and it gives you a nice sample of what's yet to come. So that's fun. And that's a pumpkin custard. The last thing I'm gonna go ahead and do, and it's all right if I use my Sam spatula, is I'm gonna go ahead and make my praline topping. I've got some soft melted butter here, which is going to be mixed with some brown sugar. Woo, it's flying brown sugar. <laughs> so I've mixed some brown sugar in with my butter. This is not health food, folks. Let's, let's put it that way. And I'm going to mix then some pecans in here. Again, you could use another nut, Brazil nuts or hazelnuts, but praline would suggest pecans or pecans, depending on how you say it. So I'm going to mix this topping and I'm going to put it on top of my frozen pie shell. If I put it on top of my liquid pie shell, it would not, it would sink in. That's why I froze my pie. Here's another trick for you. If you are making a pie and you don't really have a whole lot of time to make it homemade, what you can do is go ahead and buy a pie. Say, I'm not going to mention any brands, but there are frozen pies that you can buy that are unbaked, which is a great shortcut for this recipe and then go ahead and make this topping so it's making that frozen pie your very own pie. So I'm going to take my beautiful pie that's frozen and I'm going to put my praline topping on it. And so it's almost like a cross between a pecan pie and a pumpkin pie. So you get the best of both worlds. See how that's going to work? And I spread it on top and it gets ooey gooey and it's going to go in the oven and in about 75 minutes, we'll have pumpkin praline pie. Oh, don't forget my pumpkin custard for the kids. Or mom, who's there. Enjoy.